So again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the NAL First Thursday program. Today is October 5th. And as I said, here in Houston, we are really enjoying some very much needed rain and anticipated cooler weather. It is cooler, all right? So I'm Lisa Spence and I am your hostess for the day. Our speaker today is Ms. Haley Spears. Haley is currently a vehicle subsystem engineer for Orion with a focus on software safety. She began her career in aerospace in 2021 when she became a safety console operator in the ISS MER. In 2023, she joined the multi-purpose crewed vehicle program, better known as Orion, in safety and mission assurance. In addition to her duties in the Orion program, Haley is a regional coordinator for Industry Simulation Education, a STEM-focused nonprofit organization which organizes and runs high school aerospace engineering competitions throughout the U.S. and Canada. For 25 years, high school students have been learning about what it's really like to work at an aerospace company, in aerospace engineering company, by competing in space design competitions right here at JSC. Ms. Spears stands on the shoulders of NAL member Norm Chaffee, who spearheaded these competitions at JSC for many years. And I think several folks in the room have also participated in those. I see a lot of nodding heads and smiling faces. So thank you for doing that. In her talk, Haley is going to discuss how the competition has grown, how you can help out, and the impact that the competition has had on the next generation of aerospace professionals, such as herself. Haley has a BS in chemical engineering, uh, from the University of South Florida. After graduation, she moved to the Houston area to work at a large chemical company as a piping materials engineer, then a production engineer at several large plants producing monomers before switching industries, getting wise, and coming <laughs> to work here at NASA. So when she's not volunteering or working, Haley likes to scuba dive, garden, and spend time with her husband and their two dogs. Her talk today, like I said, is gonna be about the space settlement competition, which was run by Norm Chaffee for a very long time. She'll tell us about the competitions, changes over recent years, plans for the future, and she can speak from personal experience about how this competition can and does inspire our next generation to engage in STEM majors and enter the aerospace industry. So with that, I am going to bring up her presentation and turn it over to her. All right, yep. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for putting me into your meeting schedule. Um, it's really great to be here and talk to you guys. I know uh, many of you have volunteered with us in the past, so my hope is that some of you may be interested in um, coming back and volunteering some more. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, um, that's what I'm here for. So I wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about me first. Let me try to do this right. There we go. All right. So um, like Lisa said, my name is Haley Spears. I've got a degree in chemical engineering. I uh, graduated in 2015 and moved out here um, to Houston to work at Dow Chemical. Um, spent about six years at Dow Chemical um, and got the opportunity to switch to aerospace and I jumped on it. Um, spent about two years on that safety console. So you can see down there kind of small. Um, those are the different um, increments that I got to work. So 65 through 69. Um, I don't have any pictures of me looking like I'm making a normal face on console. I, I think that one was me Somebody asked if I was still on console and that was my response. Um, so that was the best I had, uh, but I did really like the job, I promise. And now um, I'm lucky enough to get to work um, doing software safety on Orion. So it's been quite a shift from a day-to-day -day people up on the ISS and watching them work to you know preparing for a launch that's not tomorrow. So um, it's, been a, it's been a wild ride, but... Um, I'm actually here to talk to you about space design competitions or space settlement design competitions. Um, so for anybody that hasn't heard this from Norm already, um, these are competitions that are set in kind of what I like to think of as like an optimistic post-Artemis world. So 30 to 50 years in the future, 
um, in an era when interplanetary colonization is being provided by the private sector. So um, the, the students form companies, about 50 kids per company, um, and they bid on requests for proposal, um, a new one each competition. And um, the idea is that their company will design and win the contract and build a large space settlement, like 10,000 plus people um, somewhere in our solar system. And I've got some more details on that later, um, but the kids only get about 24 hours um, to complete the task. Uh, so it's really fast um, and they deliver a design briefing at the end for our judges. Um, one company is awarded the contract and wins the competition and goes on to the international round. Um, so they'll compete with kids from like China, India, um, I believe uh, Anita Gale's on, she calls it every teenager inhabited continent. Uh, I don't think anybody from Antarctica usually plays. Um, but around the world, there's thousands of students participating annually. Um, and I was a participant myself. Um, so to kind of show more about the, the company structure. Um, so the chief executive officer will be, you know, somebody like myself or one of you guys um, who would kind of help guide the students. Um, but everybody else on this organization chart is a student, um, a high school student. So they're a company president, um, vice president of engineering or marketing and sales, um, directors of four different engineering departments, or they, the kids will be the engineers in those departments themselves. Um, so they can kind of pick um, what, what they want to do, where they want to, where they want to learn. Um, a lot of times um, as a CEO, you might have to help them decide because um, they're not really sure where they'd fit in. And I, I think any kid can make a good contribution to any, any part of this org chart, but we'll get into that a little later as well. Um, so there's a five-year chronology. Um, so that way, you know, you're in theory in high school for four years. Um, so you will never see the same competition twice when you participate. Um, so Anita will speak up if I'm wrong, but I believe this year is year, last year was year one, because um, we do these in the spring, so next year will be year two, um, and so it kind of goes through, you know, the first large settlements around Earth all the way through to, you know, the asteroid belt, Mars, and we come back to, like, Mercury and Venus, um, so like I said, it's, it's optimistic, um, but the idea is that it, it could it could be possible that the kids would see this happen in their lifetime, if not during their um, working careers. Um, and all this um, artwork is um, kids that um, they've worked on a company I helped. So it's really fun to kind of go through and when I do this kind of thing to pull their artwork and reminisce about all the interesting things they got up to. All right, so um, the actual nonprofit that puts on these regional U.S. competitions. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit um, called Industry Simulation Education. And um, so we're kind of a small team. Um, so we've got David Shaw. Um, he, along with Ty White there on the other side of me, um, kind of formed the nonprofit. Um, in the past, it was kind of like each region was very independent and put on by, you know, a different like educational organization or something like that. Um, and we really wanted to help each other and kind of pool our resources because we were all getting so busy um, that it just made sense to kind of do things together instead of separately um, and in parallel. Um, so David is kind enough and the only person willing to do what I call the nonprofit stuff. Um, like uh, you know, handling our budget, setting up our accounts, uh, making sure we're paying, you know, our the IRS if we need to, <laughs> and then um, I, I I kind of call myself content stuff, and so I don't actually write any of the content. Um, that's done by Anita Gale, um, but if if the kids are doing like training or we have you know PowerPoint slides to put up for them or something like that, um, and I usually wrangle volunteers at least for some of our competitions. Um, and then Ty White there, he is um, very proud. I'm very proud to say for Ty, he's the um, National Rural Teacher of the Year and the Teacher of the Year for Arizona. Um, so he's an excellent guy out in Arizona. And I, I call his work the teacher stuff. Um, so if we have an idea like, hey, let's run this event a little bit different, he might step in and say, well, it doesn't work like that for schools. Um, so we, we try to have each region have you know, an aerospace person and a teacher type person on each region just to kind of have a check and balance. Um, 
so right now we've got five other regional coordinators um, and that's it. Um, so we've got that in our kind of large pool of volunteers. Um, so nobody does this as their full-time job. It's like our extracurricular, you know? Um, and we are just one region, like I mentioned before. Um, and there's other nonprofits that put on the other competitions around the world. Um, so for example, there's you know thousands of kids in Asia participate every year and in the UK and the European Union, um, Australia, Africa, and Middle East, and Latin America. Um, and then INSIMED just does uh, this competition here um, at JSC, it's kind of the central time zone. And then we've got East Coast, Southwest, kind of a Pacific Northwest, and then um, one event in Canada. So it, it's kind of changed locations a few times, but we're thinking Toronto this year. Um, but we've got kids from all over Canada that participate. Okay, so here's kind of a brief timeline of the competition history. So in um, 1983, um, Anita Gale, along with her husband, Dick Edwards, and their friend, Rob Colstad, um, put on the first uh, space settlement design competition. Um, and then a few years later, 1999, um, the first SSDC at the Johnson Space Center happened. So that's where I'm calculating the 2024, 2024 should be the 25th year. Um, so in 2008 to 2010, um, I participated as a student. So that's me and Anita down there. Um, and then my team um, that I competed with over next to that. Um, and yeah, when I, when I moved to Houston, I gave Anita a call and I said, hey, do you need help? Like, you know, passing out t-shirts or something and um, immediately got pulled back in. So here I am today. Um, so in 2020, um, David and Ty created Insamed. Um, they were in the Southwest region. And so um, I kind of became the regional coordinator. Um, you know, pan it was the pandemic and it was just kind of a good time for, for Norm to, um, you know, kind of transition to, to me helping more. Um, so I, you know, gave Ty a call and said, hey, I, I think I need help. I've never run a nonprofit before and I don't really want to. Um, can I join up with you? Um, so it's been a great relationship. <laughs> And then um, in 2023, uh, we thankfully returned to in-person events. Um, so the one here is completely in-person. Um, some of our other events still have um, some kind of virtual components, um, but the one here is um, so popular. We're usually busting out of the seams of, of this building um, with about 200 students. And so we don't have an online portion. Um, and that brings us to today when I'm hoping that some of you join us or rejoin us as a volunteer. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit more about how I got here. Um, I was lucky to go to a STEM magnet program when I was in high school in Orlando, Florida. Um, and we had an international space settlement design competition team. Um, I was selected for the team um, three, three years. Um, so that's some pictures of us down there. Um, it was a great time. Uh, I'd never met an engineer before. Um, so David here and um, the guy holding the upside down sign in that one picture um, were the first engineers I ever met in my life. Um, and all of a sudden I was surrounded by dozens of people that were my age and super interested in aerospace. And um, it just kind of blew my mind that that would be a real possibility for somebody like me. Um, and then, you know, the kids get there and they're working pretty closely with the volunteers. And so they have people that worked in aerospace or currently work in aerospace telling them, you know, you could do this too. And it's one thing when your mom tells you like, oh, you're a smart girl. And like another thing when somebody from, you know, industry tells you that, you know, you have potential. So um, it was, it was definitely life-changing for me. Um, so I was more than happy to come back and volunteer. Um, so this picture here is, um, another volunteer named Hannah and then me and Anita um, doing a Grand Canyon retreat a couple years ago. Um, and then in the middle, I've got some volunteers. Those are brothers, um, Jack and James Gafford. Um, then we're holding carrots in India. Um, so we traveled halfway across the world to deliver one of the competitions and um, we got to go to a farm. <laughs> so um, and I like this picture at the bottom because it kind of reminds me of like the last supper of competition like the, the the kids are like you can't really maybe see with the zoom stuff it's like they're like illuminated by the laptops and they're so tired and they're in front of all this you know huge whiteboard and um but I, I just think it really shows what it's like at three in the morning when the kids are wrapping up their designs 
Um, here's some more pictures of some cool stuff I got to do in case this tempts anyone. Um, so this is Biosphere 2 in Arizona. Um, so that's where the Southwest competition is held. It's beautiful, super cool facility. Um, if you're not familiar, Google it. Um, in, the, in India, um, we go to the Om Shanti Retreat Center. I think it's a different location now, but you know, it's just, it's kind of like with these competitions all over the world, you know, you, you end up with friends all over the world. And so when they need somebody to come and, um, you know, volunteer, sometimes they do pool from other, other regions. So maybe somebody from around the world will come volunteer at your competition and then you'll go volunteer at theirs. Um, so that's me talking at the biosphere. It's kind of tiny, uh, but it's always, always some ways to help out. So meanwhile, I'm having what I call bad times at the plant. Um, so these are different days of me driving towards black smoke. Um, if you've been in Houston, you've probably seen that too, but it was just hard for me to drive towards it intentionally and not knowing if it was mine, or somebody else's. Is it my problem? Is it the neighbor's problem? Um, that's me turning 28 in the mess hall um, at midnight, working the night shift. Um, we, we just had a lot of, you know, all the other senior engineers kept telling me, it's not always like this. That was like their catch tricks. <laughs> But in six years, it was always like that. It was always crazy. Stuff was literally and metaphorically on fire. Um, you know, people were moving all the time. I had like, in the in the six years I was there, I had six different bosses. So it was just not a super, you know, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. I'm super grateful. Um, but it was also incredibly stressful. Um, so back to that picture earlier, um, that other CEO was, his name's Danny Nobles. And um, I'd had a really bad day at the plant. I was sitting in my car trying to like convince myself to drive home. And um, he asked, hey, are you ready to switch to, to aerospace? My company's hiring. I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> Immediately, yes. Like, I, I, I'm ready to go. Thank you for rescuing me. Um, so then now two years later, I must be getting sworn in as a, a civil servant. And I'm here at NASA. I never imagined I would be, you know, even as a kid, coming to, to JSC from Florida to participate in an aerospace competition. I, I still never thought that people, you know, people like me got to do this kind of thing. Um, and so it's just been kind of like pretty, pretty wild. And I, I like to tell the kids, you know, if I hadn't come back to volunteer and if I hadn't, you know, put my all into the competition when I was a kid and met all these adults, then, you know, where would I be today? I'd, I'd probably still be at the plant if I even decided to be an engineer. Um, so why do I do it? Um, I really wanna show as many kids as possible that they do belong and there is a place for them in the aerospace community. Um, so I think, like I mentioned, I never thought people like me got to do this kind of thing. I think a lot of kids put NASA on such a high pedestal. It just seems like an out of, out of reach dream um, that, you know, that they might not get to participate in. And at best they'll get to, you know, lightly brush by it when they do our competition. And so um, I want to show them that, you know, if I can introduce them to people that look like them, people that came from a similar background, um, you know, people that have similar interests to them um, and then they, they have made it, then that can then show them through representation. Um, engineers are real people and that they can be an engineer too. Um, as well as it just being like a really big challenge for the kids. So to kind of show them like you are capable of, you know, leading a group of your peers, you're capable of doing all of this technical work that's really hard of standing up, you know, in front of an audience and a, a intimidating panel of judges and, you know, teaching about your design. Um, and it kind of, I think, gives them confidence to pursue their dreams. I, I think it gave me the confidence to pursue my dreams um, you know, you're in college and you're struggling in these like super hard math classes, but you can look back and remember, well, my CEO believed in me and like, surely she knows what she's talking about. So it, it just, you know, provided that to me. So I'm going to give that back to the kids. Um, and yeah, I think this, the, the relationship that the kids get to form with the CEOs is kind of the magic there. And, um, you know, when, when one of their judges say, you know, you really impressed me with your idea. It's like, Mind blowing. So, yeah. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit about a typical competition schedule. So, this is different in every region, um, but this is my plan for this year for now. Um, 
So Thursday um, will be primarily some optional events. Um, so I'm going to get um, some local organizations like U of, U of H Clear Lake and um, some diversity organizations and things like that to come talk to the kids about applying for scholarships and internships. Um, a lot of the kids, you know, come from not near Houston. And so they want to come visit Space Center Houston. Um, and then we'll have a bunch of guest speakers as well. Um, and on Friday is kind of when they get down to work. Um, they'll get their RFP, uh, work on their designs. Um, they turn in their presentation Saturday morning. So if you do the math, it's less than 24 hours. Um, but after that, they'll do their presentation. Um, the judges will deliberate over lunch and we'll announce the winning teams um, after lunch. And then the kids from Iowa jump back on the bus and get a 24 hour ride bus home. So we try to get them on the road when we can. So this is downstairs in the discovery room. Um, Hoping to be from the Giller Centers here. That is painter's tape on the mural, but still gave me a heart attack. Um, so I'm proud to say that one of the kids standing up in the front there, he's actually a university student. That was one of my kids um, in 2020, and he's come back to volunteer now. Um, but so it's, you know, chaotic. It's a bunch of kids. We really pack them in. We want as many as we can to get to participate. It's just, you know, this is the best room, the Lone Star Room, um, but only one company can can be in here, so it gets a little squirrely. Um, and this is kind of an example um, of their whiteboard um, in that same room, and then hundreds of sheets of paper flying around with the same kind of preliminary ideas and designs and sketches. Um, the big challenge, though, is getting it into PowerPoint format. <laughs> uh, so this was a slide um, that some of the kids did a few years ago. I believe, yep, it was around Mercury. Um, so just kind of an example of sort of the caliber of designs we're looking for, even though they only got 24 hours. Um, this was the same company, but um, designing construction robots. So, you know, a lot of kids ask, you know, oh, I'm not really that good at math or science, um, but I can draw. It's like, thank you for being on my company because we need a lot of artwork and it can be really hard to uh, learn how to communicate your ideas visually. Um, so yeah, these kids did some, uh, so I believe this was on Mars and they had a, different types of spacesuits and they had to say, you know, how many will you have and what's, what's their features, but they were not tasked with specifically designing the suit. So I thought that was kind of some cute artwork of folded up suits hanging there. Um, and then we, we asked them to do all kinds of life support stuff as well. You know, how are you going to feed these people? Um, in this case, what does their air look like? Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of the companies may forget that if you lower your total atmospheric pressure, your percent of oxygen has to go up or people suffocate. Um, so that's usually a good quick check. These guys did it right. Um, here, I don't remember where this settlement was, but um, they had some glass windows they designed and then a cross section of like a regular section of their hull. Um, so you just know some of these kids researched this and were like super into it and they have to argue with their peers why we want to do hydrogenated boron nitride nanotubes. And um, so it's really fun to watch them talk about it and really get into it. Um, and these guys were in the asteroid belt. So they talked about the different types of asteroids that they would hope to encounter and then um, potentially gather materials from. So it's, it's, relatively high level, you know, we're not asking them to actually do really serious like calculus. Um, they're just kind of doing, I always tell them if you're doing more than like multiplication, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, you're probably doing it wrong um, for this competition because they have 24 hours. So our expectations have to kind of kind of match that. Um, so this is the aftermath of that same company. Um, the president there with the long hair is writing his speech and everybody else is passed out. Um, so all those kids came with us to finals this year and it was super fun <laughs> to meet up with them and, um, watch them do it again, but with more kids and more days. Um, so I'll, I'll let you read this on your own. Let me see if I can make this a little smaller. Uh, so we, we usually have our teachers, um, they're wonderful. They're super great. Um, 
we've had the same teachers coming back. Um, you know, teachers that when I was a student, I met as teachers are now coming back and we're still bringing their kids. We've got teachers that were kids that participated, that became teachers. Now they bring their students. Um, so they're really wonderful. Um, this is one kid who he played at least six times. I think it may have been seven by the time he graduated, but um, he said he learned something completely new every time and signed up every time we let him. Um, so he was great. And this is kind of a long quote, but um, one of our students said this at finals. And I told him like, man, you're gonna make me cry. Um, but I think it kind of embodied my experience as well. Um, so you figure out kind of who you are, what you wanna do. Um, not necessarily your, your final form, but it's kind of a really good environment to kind of practice those skills. And um, like you said, make friends, make memories and make mistakes. So you've got me like this poor kid in Orlando, never been anywhere. And now I've got friends in India and friends in China and friends in Australia. And um, I still keep up with them today, actually. Um, so super valuable, I think, if I haven't made that clear yet. Um, so here's the US and Canada dates. Um, there's Kind of uh, my region and Thai's region are the most fully planned so far. Um, so here at JSC, we'll be um, at the Gilroo Center from March 21st through the 23rd. Um, and then we'll be at Biosphere 2 in Arizona um, in January. Um, and then we've got our other events planned there, um, but I think we're still waiting on the facilities to confirm the dates. So I don't want you to necessarily um, be disappointed if those move around, but... Um, this is, I guess, what they call an eye chart, right? Uh, but it's the different volunteer roles. Um, so I mentioned company CEO. You know, you're really kind of guiding the students along, um, not designing for them, but they'll, they'll say some crazy stuff. You know, like, that's not how physics works. Or like, that's not, like, did you forget we don't have gravity? That kind of thing. Um, so we always have new CEOs paired up with experienced CEOs. So if it's your first time, that's fine, um, you know, someone will be there to guide you, but it is a full two day commitment. Um, so you're pretty much there the whole time the kids are working. Um, you don't have to stay overnight, but most do. And um, sometimes that's a little painful. Um, so it's not required. <laughs> um, judging is only a six hour commitment on Saturday, um, but it flies by. So you watch their four presentations and then you deliberate um, and pick which company gets the contract. So that can also be really fun. You can kind of just slide in at the end and see the good stuff. Um, and if you want to do just maybe four hours of that, we've got what's called red team reviewer. And so at the halfway point, they come in and they give them initial advice like, hey, you know, your design is not gonna work at all or you completely forgot, you know, this really important portion of it um, to kind of make sure that they hear other voices. I think the CEOs, you know, you can lead a horse to water and you can't make them drink, um, but hearing it from like a new voice kind of <laughs> kind of helps. Um, we also always have guest speakers. So sometimes that's just one, sometimes we'll have three or four. Um, show the kids, you know, cool stuff that you worked on or that you're working on now, um, inspire them to you know be like you. Um, usually that's about 30 minutes, either on Thursday or Saturday. Um, and we can do them virtually too. So if you're gonna be out of town, you can still, um, be a speaker. Um, we've also got tech training. So we've got some slides um, that you can go over with the kids to teach them about like structural engineering, operations engineering, uh, human factors or automation. Um, it takes about an hour. So that's kind of our, our shortest option. Um, and the last one I call like ro roving advisors. So I try to get as many people as I can um, to just come in and kind of walk around, see what the kids are working on and give them kind of instantaneous feedback um, so that they can see um, kind of another viewpoint on their design, or maybe they have like a really specific question um, and maybe that's something that you worked on. Um, so I also kind of wanted to talk about um, the costs for the event. Um, by far our greatest cost is just feeding everybody um, that whole time. Um, luckily the Gilroo Center gives us a really extremely fair price um, on renting pretty much every room in the facility. Um, the kids sleep in the gym, in the ballroom. Um, you know, they work in all the rooms. And um, this next year I'm even renting like the small conference rooms. Um, so if you know of any companies that ever sponsor, you know, educational events, that kind of thing, um, I would love to help 
uh, or I would love if you could help me make those connections with them. Um, a lot of our sponsors over COVID um, have kind of slowed down on their on their funding of that kind of thing, or we've kind of lost that relationship. Um, but uh, one special project this year. Um, so I, I got to meet some foster kids that came on site a few months ago. And so they are with the Texas Workforce Commission um, Vocational Rehab Services Office. So it's kids in the foster care system who have you know, some kind of disability, whether it's like a learning disability or they're blind or deaf. And so their goal was to kind of similar to what I want to do, like show the kids that they can come work at NASA despite, you know, their situation and where they came from. And um, so my goal is to get five kids on scholarship um, to come to the competition. So um, the cost per kid is about $190 per student. So my goal is to cover, to cover that. That's my fundraising goal minimum this year. Um, so yeah, I feel like there's a lot of words, um, but I've got my NASA email and my uh, volunteer email on there as well as my phone number. Um, if you want to scan that QR code, it'll take you to all of our social media um, pages. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or you want to get on the list for being a volunteer. Um, so yeah, um, I can take any questions. Start with the room, probably. And, yeah, uh, anybody in the room have any? And then we can do chat for the questions. I think it's working. Yes. It's working? Okay, anybody in the room have questions? Stella, I know you're not to ask a question. <laughs> I was copying from there. <laughs> okay, I uh, just so you know, I do have uh, the charts, uh, the, the PDF files. So if you need to actually scan the PDF file, I'll have that available as well. Any questions for Haley? That went by really quick. Well, how do they get down here? They, they pay their own way, right? Yeah, they, they do technically. So the question was, um, how do the kids get here? Do they pay their own way? Um, so about half of our kids are from Iowa every year. Um, so they've been bringing um, a couple of busloads of kids down. Um, and for a lot of our teachers, they've been coming so long um, that they have found like local ways to get the competition fundraised. And they have built it into their budget and a lot of schools are really supportive. Um, some of our newer schools are not so lucky. Um, so some some kids are in the situation where they can ask mom and dad for, for money uh, to participate and that's no problem. Um, but where I'm seeing now, um, I kind of want to reach the kids that are not in that, in that situation. Um, so that's where in the past, um, any, fund, any funding that we can get from the community um, kind of goes towards providing for those kids uh, first. And then, um, you know, when, when I'm working with caterers, the first thing I ask is like, hey, I'm an educational nonprofit. Here's what I'm doing. Can you help out? Like, you know, uh, so, yeah, we really run it at cost. I think our overhead is like a small fraction of a percent every year. So um, the kids, the kids are paying for it um, per person, um, but a lot of them get funding through their schools. Um, so if that answers fully. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Any volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> Any deep pockets? <laughs> what percentage of the students are returning? All of them? Or? So it, it depends. Um, it kind of changes with each region. So um, the, the JSC competition is so popular that a lot of the teachers have a rule that you can only come once because they want the most number of kids total to get to play. Um, and a lot of them have the caveat that if you win, you can come back. Um, so um, I would say a good ratio is half and half, like half returning, half new, but it's usually about 25% returning, I would estimate. Um, so a lot of times the kids are, uh, they kind of need a little more guidance because they, they haven't seen it before. And then once they see it once, they're kind of ready to hit the ground running. Yeah. Yeah. How are they selected to, to the competition? Uh, each school does it a little different. Um, so right now we let the schools manage manage that. And so um, we asked the school, you know, you, I've been telling them you can bring up to 10. I think we're going to have to lower it to maybe eight or even lower um, to allow any school that wants to come to bring at least some kids. Um, in the past, we've had to limit it to like three or four kids per school, but we still let the teachers choose which kids come. Um, but in other regions, they have preliminary rounds. And so maybe the school will participate with 40 kids. And then from that, um, they'll 
narrow it down and the kids that win, you know, the preliminary round are invited to come to the live competition. So we haven't implemented that yet, but we might need to. <laughs> yeah, fam. Um, I was going to mention related to this, that um, I don't know if y'all are still doing this, but they mix the kids all up. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're not working with the eight kids that came from your school. You it's keep that. a fantastic cacophony of craziness and enthusiasm. And it's something to see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for the people online, Pam's comment was that, you know, you might have eight kids come from one school, but they do not play together. So we'll, we divide them up. Um, so that way, you know, a kid that's unpopular at his school can still run for president of his company here and win. And it, it's not a popularity contest and the kids have to meet the, 40 new people. The social yeah. dynamics of this competition is something in and of itself. Oh, it's crazy. Um, and it's, it's, it's so fast. Yeah. Yeah. David? Oh, all the so other regions do keep the students together from really? one school. They do, yeah. Um, and it's very different. It is. I bet. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, like when um, when I volunteered yeah. in India, they, they keep the same schools together. So your company will have four schools. It's like competition within competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they, and then and then you kind of, you tend to trust the kids that you came with. And it, it's harder to work together with the kids that came from other schools. But if you all came from a different school, um, it's an even playing field. And yeah, I, I will say it's been fascinating to work and volunteer in other regions because the kids, while they are very different around the world, they're also exactly the same. Um, and so, you know, it's like the exact same mistakes, the same things that they do right, the same ways they work with each other. Um, it's just that sometimes I don't speak the same language that they do. Um, but yes, it's been cool. In that regard, do you do everything in English? We do, yeah. Um, so most of our volunteers and most of our uh, judges and all the materials are in English. So in most regions, I think Latin America translates it um, some years, um, but everything else is in English, which but, part so of the lesson for the kids. Team, in theory, they all know English. English. Yeah. So well. sometimes you need to do some translation and we're getting more into like Latin America um, with some, some other events. So, yeah, my, we might you might mention the tournament, which has Mexico, and a lot of the students in Mexico are not very good with English, so they yeah. try to do a lot of the work internally in Spanish, but then they have to present in English. Although we've yeah. experimented a little bit with having somebody act as an interpreter, like we would with working with Russia here. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's been interesting. Part of the lesson is you know, a lot of aerospace is done in English still. And so, you know, when you come to work on the ISS or if you want to be an astronaut, you need to know more than one language. Um, so it's, you know, no time like the present to try to learn how to do something technical in English. So, yeah. So they're at Delroot. Do they have time to take a tour of JSD or you take the Space Center in Houston? Or... So um, in, the, in the past, we had like an, uh, a Space Act agreement set up and they were able to actually do some work in Building 9. Um, but over the years, they've kind of changed how that is you know, working on site and it became really prohibitively expensive. Um, so it also limits that the kids have to be uh, like U.S. citizens if they're going to work in Building 9. So um, here at the Gilroo Center, you know, if you're an exchange student, you can come participate. Um, and the only tour that we did last year was Rocket Park. Um, so we actually had Norm meet us up there and uh, he gave them a, a tour. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're leaning towards. It also is just really time, time consuming as well. And so um, we, we, we keep playing around with, do we make a the competition shorter or longer, or shorter or longer. Um, but right now, yeah, we're just really touring Rocket Park. But a lot of them want to go to Space Center Houston. So that's why I'm thinking this year, um, Thursday, we'll kind of have free time. Like, do you want to meet, you know, with the Society of Women Engineers and you know, the University of Houston, or do you want to go to Rocket Park and they can kind of choose? Because um, for a lot of these kids, it's their first time out of Iowa. Um, and they are like literally like, they live on a farm. Um, they've never seen, they go to Galveston and, you know, that's the only time they've ever seen like that much water in one place. And um, so I don't want to take away the fun of it, but I also want to like really maximize their experience. So it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. But that's where really our guest speakers come in because then, 
you know, over 20 to 30 minutes, you can kind of introduce them to some new concept um, or new thing that they didn't know about. And maybe they'll want to do that when they grow up. Yeah. There any online questions? Yeah. Well, I got one through text, and that's from okay. uh, Xavier. Oh, cool. He would like to know if there is uh, how many students from around the world have had the SSDC program, has the SSDC program reached so far? Oh, like total? Yeah. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, that might be an Anita question if she's done the math already. I would guess easily 30,000 between, you know, some, some of our regions pass thousands of kids a year through their, um, their system. So in, in the U S it's, it's kind of surprisingly, um, less immediately popular. So, um, you know, you think of the UK as a relatively small place and for them to have a thousand kids, well, why don't I have a thousand kids, you know? And I think, um, we've just kind of let it grow organically. And I, I think working together with the other coordinators, we're able to kind of share, you know, best practices, um, but the JSC event with 200 kids is our biggest um, U.S. based event every year. Um, so, I'm gonna get those numbers up, but yeah. yeah. And about 250 in India, typically. Yeah, well, and then the, if you count the preliminary rounds too and yeah, stuff, thousands in Asia, Asia as well. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it could be anywhere, you know, 100, 100 to 200, 250 kids per competition down selecting yeah. to. What is it, 12 to 18 that are the winners that get to go to the international? Yeah, yeah. So from each each region, so in the US, there's you know four regions and the one Canadian region. Um, there's 12 kids that go to the finals round. So for for some places that have a thousand kids that start down to 12, you know, they've they've had to go in through multiple competition rounds. And I know one thing that Anita really wanted to do was make sure that it's it wouldn't become the kind of sport where the kids have to go every single weekend for six months. Um, to play. And so um, we're trying to keep it from being that kind of like burden on, on families and their time. Yeah, Anita says thousands of kids per year. We don't even know how many kids participate, total participate yeah. in the international regional expert. Yeah, yeah. Some of the regions don't share their data um, as freely, but thousands a year, um, which is great. Could you talk a little bit more about the international competition? Yeah, of you course. Kind of focus more on that. Yeah, yeah. So Insemed only puts on um, the U.S. and Canada competitions, and there's another nonprofit called Aerospace Education Competitions, um, which is sort of the parent um, organization. And so they put on um, the international round. And um, so, you know, as, as each regional coordinator says, "Hey, I did my competition. I have 12 kids." Um, we kind of pass them off to Anita, um, and it's. A lot of the same faces, um, you know, as the other competitions, you know, a lot of the same CEOs and stuff. Um, and we all meet in Florida and um, at the at KSC, um, the Center for Space Education, and it's um, a three day long competition. And um, so the, the kids are paired up, you know, the 12 kids that one here might be paired up with 12 kids from China, 12 kids from Uruguay, and 12 kids from Germany. And then we say, okay, you are now a company and like, here's your RFP and they do it again. Um, so that's a huge challenge. Um, you know, a lot of these kids have never met or really interacted with people from other places. And now they are up for three days straight working on like technical designs um, with people that are so different from them. Uh, but they learn that they're really not that different. And they learn that, you know, um, you have to trust people to win, um, which was hard for me as a kid. Um, but I always give the advice to them that the teams that win are the teams that figure out how to get along and focus on the work and not on their differences. Um, so, yeah, did you have any specific questions, Lisa, about finals? Or? No, I just wanted to kind of talk oh, yeah. a little bit more about it. Yeah, no, it's it's a trip. It's fun. Do the other, the other they do all of that in English? They do, yeah. And so usually all those kids, um, I would say 95% do speak English by the time they get to finals, yeah. So can you talk about the limits to how many regions can go into the international competition and what we've been doing with the tournaments yeah, sure to thing. expand that. Yeah, so um, there is kind of the way that, that things have been set up, um, it's kind of hard once you have more than about like 50 or 60 kids in a company for it to function with any amount of sense. Um, there's just too many kids um, and uh, not enough something. Uh, so 
um, if you if you do take that number and you say, well, each each presentation and question session takes about 45 minutes to an hour, um, how many of those can a judge listen to and absorb and comprehend and really properly judge? Um, it's usually like four or five, maybe. Um, so if you do the math, we're usually stuck at about 250 kids total per competition. Um, so uh, some regions kind of do some, some, they kind of do it another way. So like I mentioned in the UK, they have, you know, thousands of kids. And so they don't necessarily pick 12 kids that won at one event and send them. They kind of pick kids from around the country that they have deemed in their own system to be worthy of going. Um, so that's not what we do here in the US. Here you have to win at the one competition. And um, from there, you're 12 of you are selected. Um, so with that being said, once they get to finals and we only have room for so many groups of 12 kids. Um, so Anita, um, along with David and a bunch of other volunteers have started to do like what they're calling tournaments. And so these don't lead to finals. So the kids just play and they're done, um, but it's still really valuable. And um, we found that they don't need the carrot of winning a spot at finals to still have fun and still participate. Um, and we've also gotten better at doing these things virtually. Um, so there's kids from like rural Mexico um, that participate. Um, and so, yeah, it kind of lets anybody, like if you want your whole school to get to participate, you can do a 250 kid tournament just with your high school, um, for example, so. You know, there's, it's a scalability factor with the yeah. but the idea with the, uh, with the tournaments is any organization could set up their own tournament and make an agreement with ACC yeah. to be able to run a tournament with their people in their region or their area or wherever they want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So that it eliminates that scalability issue with the capacity of the hotel at, uh, at Titusville yeah. and the visitor center auditorium and such. Yeah, Center for, for space sure. education. It's kind of experimenting with trying to overcome this limit to uh, scalability and growth. Yeah. Uh, Anita yeah, says that Anita also adds that at finals, 12 teams come from semifinals, four come from qualifying competitions, and eight teams are invited at competition organizers' discretion. So you might want to talk about qualifying competitions too. Yes. So I guess, um, real quick, I know we got. A question back there. Okay. Um, Imagine this competition. What does it really consist of? Um, so, good question. Um, so the kids, the kids are kind of they're pretending to work for a company like you know Boeing, um, but it, you know we use fictional names um, that Anita's come up with, and um, so the kids bid. A, on a design, you know, on a request for proposal. And so they say, you know, here's our preliminary design. Um, you should pick our company kind of presentation. And so it's not like a really detailed, like engineering product that they're producing. Um, they just R do some, some basic calculations. RFP. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. And um, so, so yes, so the, the kids are kind of pretending to really be in, in industry and like their Axiom or SpaceX, you know, bidding on, um, like I think the RFP for the vehicle to bring down ISS came out. Um, so they pretend that they are bidding on this large space settlement contract. Um, and so when they win, um, they're the, the company that got the contract. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun because, you know, that's, you know, a lot of our volunteers, like um, especially Anita, you know, did that kind of work for a long time. And so you're kind of able to talk about what it's like um, to do that kind of work. And um, it's a pretty realistic experience. Um, I haven't worked on any RFP teams professionally, but um, yeah. David says it's, it's realistic. So, yeah. Uh, also, subcontractors, the idea that we've added recently of subcontractors being sort of the. Yeah. The, I forgot to bring my new, program books. The new, um, uh, the new space kind of contractors. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of subcontractors. So, you as your company get to, get to choose who you would work with and who you want on your on your bid. Um, so we encourage them to use them because why would you not use somebody that's supposed to be an expert on that technology? Um, why reinvent the wheel? But sometimes they don't listen. So what's the prize that they win? Um, primarily bragging rights. Um, but then the, the carrot for these, uh, for the regionals 
uh, the semifinals is really that 12 of them get to go to finals. Um, so usually it's like the company leadership or the kids that really stood out. Um, but yeah, really, it's just that they they work so hard. When when they when Anita announces the winner, they scream and they're crying. It's like this huge deal, and they're just so proud of themselves. So and yeah, the the teachers will come up and say like, I, I haven't had a kid win in fifteen years, you know. But um, I never won, to be clear, um, not even once. Um, <laughs> but I have one as a CEO, so I, I count that. Um, but yeah. So Anita adds, subcontractors provide standard commodities made from water resources, e.g. air, water, recycling, toilet paper, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, why reinvent the wheel if, if your company isn't an expert at doing something, but there's a subcontractor that can bid with you on the contract. Um, so that kind of emulates the real world as well. So, yeah. And for tournaments, they might get to come to the Space Center Houston for a tour. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, um, like I know some of the first times we did a tournament in Brownsville, Texas, the the prize that their um, organization set up for them was that they came here and presented their designs for some NASA people. So um, usually it's kind of different for each region, but um, technically bragging rights is all we give them. Presented um, in building one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was fun for them. Um, go ahead. So what states are in this region? So this region kind of roughly follows the central time zone. Um, so they're kind of uh, very vertical regions, um, but we, we don't usually exclude any kids. So like if a kid in um, Alabama wants to come, you know, that's central time zone. I think we've had like two kids from Alabama. Um, it's, it really has been about 50% Iowa, 50% Texas in the past. Oh, okay. Iowa jumped into it. <laughs> And Anita adds, winning teams get a medal. I was Often. Um, yeah, we, we haven't in a few years. Um, we're really running the leanest budget possible. Um, but yeah, the, the, when you win at finals, you get a big trophy and a medal. So, uh, and a trophy for school's trophy kids. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, so my personal goal is to kind of make sure um, that um, among the regions, it's, it's as fair as possible. Um, so for example, in our East Coast region, most of our kids come from the Northeast, um, even though you know we do this, this big finals event in Florida, um, I think there's only a small handful of schools that participate in Florida. Um, so something that in Semed has kind of allowed us to do is, you know, I'm focusing on my region, um, but we've got, you know, that this group of eight people that are really dedicated to their regions. And, you know, we're not, like it's not just somebody from Iowa and somebody from Houston um, worrying about their two perspective areas. We've got, you know, Ty knows every other teacher of the year in the country. And so we've been able to expand um, through kind of each of our personal networks combining. Um, so I think uh, Anita set, puts it that she wants every kid in the U.S. to have the opportunity to participate um, if they would like to. And we have not yet probably accomplished that, but um, I think over time we're getting closer and we're getting better at reaching new schools. It's kind of crazy. Like you, you try to explain it to like a teacher and they're kind of like, I am not going to come sleep on the gym floor for three days with my kids and $200 a kid. Um, is there something that you do that's an hour long? And it's like, well, no. Um, but once they come once or twice, um, they're usually hooked and then they come every time and I have to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you can't bring 50 kids. You can only bring five. And um, so once we get them in, they're in, but it takes some time to get new ones. I think Pam was first. No, I just thought of it while you were saying what you were saying that you might want to comment to them the, the transgression that you see is, you know, the happiness when they get there and they're put on teams in a fun way and all of this, and then they you know, they get their structure, their uh, corporate structure set up, and they get to work, and, and then they're like, oh, this is really hard, and there's like a downturn, you know, and then they start making progress, and then about dinner time, you see them all think, we, we got this, we can do yeah. this and stuff, and then, you know, later on when it's time to like head towards bed, there's a moment where it's uh, the politically correct <laughs> way to say this, but it's like the oh shit point, where yeah. they realize, we didn't know what the heck we're doing. We're not even you know, remotely close 
to being right. Yeah, and then it turns into an all nighter. You know, they think it's oh, yeah. an all nighter. You know, you don't tend to tell the kids it's going to be an all nighter. Anyway, it's the progression as they work through is. Um, you can tell them for an hour they can watch one of the presentations at the end. Yeah, yeah. So get, get, get their kids to watch the presentation. So so it's yeah, it's really so Thursday they're like all pumped, they're at NASA, it's like the coolest thing that they've ever done. They're so excited. It's a field trip, an overnight field trip, and they're like a teenager, you know? And it's so it's like super cool. They just got off this huge bus. Um and then uh they kind of get, they, they, they do like their company elections, you know, choose who does what and where, and then they, they get the request for proposal and the kids that have been there before, are like, okay, everybody stop talking. Like it's, it's serious time. Like we're, we're almost out of time. Like we have to, we have to get going. And, um, you know, the other ones kind of catch on and they, and they start working. And then, yeah, it's like each meal they're like, oh my gosh, we're, we're behind. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're going to be up all night. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to be the best company ever and finish by 8 PM. And they don't. And um, so we don't, we don't require them to stay up all night, but they're so excited and they want to do so well. Um, I've never had a team that didn't stay up all night. Um, so they, I mean, they literally are working heads down, you know, pencil to paper, working in CAD, um, arguing with each other about like technical stuff, um, practicing their presentations on until their presentation starts at 8 a.m. So from basically 8 a.m. Saturday till 8 a.m. Sunday, you know, the teachers are saying like, I've never seen my kids focus for 45 minutes straight, but they just focused for 24 hours straight. And I'm used to beg them to eat. I mean, you're like, hello, it's dinner. Like you can't skip meals here. You know, you have to take care of you. You have to eat, come on, dude. So it's pretty fun. <laughs> At least I think so. Yeah. What about tools? I mean, you talk about CAD. Yeah, so the, they yeah, they, they typically bring um, pretty much all the kids have Chromebooks now pretty easily at school. Um, so they at least have sort of that mini laptop. Um, a lot of them bring their own like gaming computers and stuff that can do the high powered CAD. And usually it's kids that either took CAD in school or they're just interested on their own. Um, so they, they typically bring the equipment and this this facility is a challenge because the internet situation isn't great. Um, and you, you try to tell them that, you know, all that they need is in their program book and in their heads, um, but they don't believe it because they've never done something like this without the internet. Um, but they make it through. Um, typically we can get at least like four or five kids on the internet and then they kind of share those, those computers. So it's kind of fascinating to watch. Like a lot of them have never, never been in an academic situation without a computer. Um, but yeah, and then in the past, we've had like a big library. So Anita has like a lot of books about living in space. Um, and, you know, if they're doing something on the moon, you know, we'll bring the moon maps, um, for example. Um, so that's kind of fun to watch them figure that out, how to use a book. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, they, they, they uh, I, I know that, you know, I'm not up there, but the kids keep me young. I know all the teenagers are slang. Um, so that's kind of fascinating. Um, as long as you're on good terms with them, they're usually nice. <laughs> so yeah, they're cool. Yeah. Any other questions for Haley? If you think of more, um, please feel free. Um, I think I scrolled away from it, but um, yeah. I think I lagged it out. There we go. Um, so yeah, feel free to email me. Um, you give me a call. I may not pick up, um, but that's not intentional. I just get a lot of spam. Um, so, yeah, thank you all. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> much, Haley. Um, and as she said, she's always looking for more volunteers and funding organizations. So if you have any ideas of people, places, and things that can help with this competition, I think everybody would be very much appreciated. And as she said, um, she's an example, you know, she is a product of, of the competition itself. So, so it, it does good things. And uh, for those of you in the room, I know she was kind of hiding behind the podium most of the time, but uh, I don't think she'd be too upset if I shared that she and her husband are expecting their very own next generation aerospace engineer in January. So congratulations to, to Haley on that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the video recording for today's presentation will be available in a few days on our, our NAIL website. 
Um, our next first Thursday is going to be on November 2nd. So it's coming up really fast. So um, also just a, another little public service announcement that doesn't have anything to do with my socks. Uh, but be sure to come out next weekend, next Saturday for the JSC open house. Lots of really interesting stuff going on for the open house. It also happens to be the day of the annular ring of fire eclipse. Um, I just saw on, on uh, the roundup this morning that you can get your very own glasses to observe the eclipse um, if you come here for the open house. So I think that would be a whole lot of fun for every everybody. And the last public service announcement that I'm going to give you, I promise, the last thing I'm going to tell you about today is to be sure and head on over to the Blue Bonnet Pavilion for the keg of the month. All right. Thank you. <laughs>